Thanks very much. Uh, again, let's sort of recall where we are. We have gamma. This is the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set. We have gamma hat mapping class group of S2 minus a counter set. Uh, there's a short exact sequence, this Berman exact sequence pi 1 of S2 minus Cantor maps to gamma, maps to gamma hat. Um, we have an action of gamma on the ray graph, which is delta hyperbolic. We've got some interesting loxodromic elements. And uh, <coughs> I want to talk about uh, constructions of elements of the space of, well, homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma arising from this action. Um, so one remark to make is that actually somehow all interesting quasimorphisms on gamma do actually arise from the action on R. It's not just that this is a way of constructing some, but it turns out that really is a C sort of somehow everything. Um, to, to prove this, I need to sort of tell you a little bit of homological algebra. Um, the first thing to note is, um, so, when you have a short exact sequence of groups, um, you probably know, so if you think of H upper one, just homomorphisms to a group uh, as a contravariant functor from groups to vector spaces, it's not uh, an exact functor, but it's left exact. You have a short exact sequence of groups, you know, A maps to B maps to C, then hom from C to R maps to hom from B to R maps to hom from A to R, and it's left exact. Well, quasimorphisms sort of work in a similar way. So associated to this short exact sequence of groups, there's uh, a, a left exact sequence in quasimorphisms, uh, homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma hat maps to homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma maps to homogeneous quasimorphisms on pi 1 of S2 minus a counter set, and in fact the gamma hat invariant subset of this, right? This is uh, this group here is a conjugation action of gamma hat on it, and so the sp vector space has a sort of an action of gamma hat on it, and you want the invariant part. So there's a sort of a left exact sequence here. Um, so this is the first fact. The second fact, so this is just pure homological algebra. The, the proof is not very interesting. If you know the reason why H upper 1 is left exact, it's basically uh, the same argument, more or less. Um, second fact, which is, is kind of interesting, uh, is that actually this group is 0. So that tells you everything here, in fact, comes from quasimorphisms on this point pushing subgroup, right? So think of this, this is a subgroup of the mapping class group of the plane minus counter set. It's just a subgroup where the counter set stays where it is and infinity just moves around. Okay, that's an interesting subgroup of the mapping class group. But all the interesting quasimorphisms actually come from infinity braiding around inside the counter set. And that's all sort of witnessed, in fact, in the action uh, of gamma on the ray graph. So this is true. Why is this true? So um, by generalized Bavard duality, this is equivalent to showing that the stable commutator length vanishes identically on gamma hat. 
Um, and in fact, something stronger is true. Uh, this group is uniformly perfect. So every element in this group is a product of at most, I don't know, three commutators. So actually, I'll just say commutator length bounded by, I think, some constant, maybe three. Um, and the proof of this is sort of a, so I'll say, it's a, a standard trick in theory of, of um, transformation groups. It's the so-called suspension trick. Uh, certainly goes back at least to Mather and, and probably a lot further, uh, Robinson, I guess. Anyway, so this is a very old trick. Maybe this is, this is sort of goes back to the ancient Greeks, probably. But um, <laughs> so the way it works is, so we've got a, um, we're going to say that um, a mapping class phi is local if it's supported in some proper disk. Okay, so here's, we have phi, it's doing something interesting in here, it's the identity outside, we're isotopic to the identity outside. Okay, so now we're in the sphere minus the cataset. It's very important that we're in the sphere, not the plane. Okay. Um, so, the first remark to make is that if phi is local, then actually phi is a commutator. Well, or it would be the identity, but it's a commutator. Um, and the proof is um, the following. So this is a proof. So here's a, another way of drawing the cataset. So I draw the cataset, the part inside this disk, as this blob here, and I'm going to draw the rest of it as a sequence of sort of cadasets getting kind of smaller and smaller, um, and maybe some other stuff left over. So there's some extra cataset here. So here's disk D, and the rest of the cataset, I'm just going to draw it like that. So phi is supported in here. Okay? So then all you sort of need to do is find something which takes this and pushes it off itself in a way where it just kind of accumulates on nothing. So I'm going to look at, at something like called psi. So psi is going to take this to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and so on. And I don't really care what it does here. Maybe it takes this and drags it out over this entire thing. Don't really care. But it's taking this disk to this disk to this disk, and so on. So what I can do is I can look at the product um, from j equals zero to infinity of phi conjugated by psi to the power of j. So what is that? So this is a product of infinitely many things. So you have to worry about whether it's well defined, but it's a product of infinitely many things which have disjoint support. So it makes sense to do them all simultaneously, and that's what we mean by the product. So it's the mapping class which does phi on this disk, and then it does phi conjugated by psi on this disk. And then it does phi conjugated by psi squared on this disk. And so on and so forth. So it just sort of does a copy of phi on each of these disks simultaneously in such a way that psi conjugates one copy to the next copy. All right? So this is an element. And if we take the commutator of this with psi, well, that is this element, this infinite product, times the inverse of the conjugate of this by psi. What's the conjugate of this by psi? Well, it's phi on this disk and this disk and this disk and this disk. In fact, all of them except the first one. So if I do a copy of phi on all of these disks, and then I multiply it by the inverse of a copy of phi on all of these disks except the first one, well, the product is just phi on the first disk, which is phi. So it exhibits this as, uh, so phi is a commutator. So that's the proof. All right, so if phi is local, it's a commutator. And so then if you have any element, it turns out it's very easy to write it as a product of finitely many local things. So any homeomorphism H, um, let's for the sake of argument, let's suppose H moves some point somewhere. Let's suppose H moves some P in the counter set to HP not equal to P. So here's P 
and here's HP, and they're each in their own little piece of counter set, and the rest of the counter set's over here. So what does H do? Well, it takes this thing to this thing. So I'm going to make a slightly bigger disk, and I'm going to define something new, and I'm going to call it um, maybe phi. So what phi is going to do is phi restricted to this disk here, call this D, this is H of D, phi restricted to D equals H restricted to D. And also, phi is supported in E. So E is this bigger disk. Phi is supported in E. So I kind of have two disks in E. I have D and I have phi of D. And phi takes D to phi of D. Sorry, and H takes D to H of D. And phi also takes D to H of D. So phi and H agree on D. But H, I don't know what it does to this thing here. I don't care. I'm going to make phi take this just back. Take it back over here. Okay, so phi is just supported in E. It just takes these two disks and switches them around in such a way that it takes this disk to this disk in the same way that H does. So I've built a new homomorphism phi, which is local because it's supported on E, so it, it's fixed here. So I've produced a new guy phi, which is local, and which agrees with H on this disk. Okay? Well, so if you write H times phi inverse, this is fixed on D. It's the identity on D. So in particular, it's supported on the complement of D. And if we're on the sphere, then the complement of D is another disk. And so this guy here is local because it's supported. This is supported on S2 minus D, which is also a disk, and therefore it's also local. So H times something local is local. So H is a product of two things that are local, and each local thing is a commutator, so H is a product of two commutators. So that was true of H moved some point somewhere. Maybe H fixes every point. Well, then I can just multiply H by something local so that the result moves some point somewhere else. So then H is a product of three things. At any arbitrary H is a product of at most three things, all of which are local and therefore all of which are commutators. So that was, so that says the commutator length of every element is at most three. So by the way, this proves that the group is perfect. All right, everything is a product of commutators. Also, the stable commutator length is vanished, b vanishes because, well, H is a product of at most three commutators. H squared is a product of at most three commutators. H to the seven is a product of at most three commutators, and so on and so forth. So stable commutator length vanishes identically, and therefore, there are no interesting homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma hat at all, and therefore, all the interesting homogeneous quasimorphisms on gamma <coughs> come from uh, quasimorphisms on pi one of S2 minus the counter set, those that are sort of invariant under this interesting mapping class action. So let me remark that this argument almost shows that Q of gamma vanishes, but it doesn't quite do it. Everything that I did here, so something which is local still makes sense in the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set, in fact, any surface minus a counter set. And Something local is always a commutator by exactly this argument. Sorry, you lost me. Then you explain very clearly that it's a product of two commutators. And yes. And then it's three. Oh, I assumed here that H moved some point off itself. So, supposing H fixes every point, well, I compose H with something local, which moves the point P off itself. So, yeah. Um, okay. So. This argument shows that in the plane minus a counter set, anything local is a commutator. And it also shows that anything can be written as the product of something local with something which is supported on not S2 minus the disk, but supported on R2 minus the disk. <laughs> 
So that's not local, that's kind of anti-local. It means it's supported outside some disk. The difference is which side of the disk is, the, is infinity on. So on S2, there is no point at infinity and the complement of a disk is a perfectly good disk. But in R2, the complement of a disk that doesn't contain infinity, that disk does contain infinity. And if a disk contains infinity, then you can't apply this trick. And it's not obviously a commutator. And in fact, some elements are not commutators. And it's precisely where is infinity? What's it doing? Okay. <coughs> Um, but this argument actually ends up showing, so um, I'll just say fact, if phi in gamma fixes some ray, then in fact uh, the commutator length of phi is at most three. So the same argument works, not for an arbitrary element, but if you, if you fix a ray. So somehow, Here's infinity and here's some ray. So if you have a homomorphism that fixes some ray, then it's almost as though infinity can be collapsed along this ray into the Cantor set. You have to play a little bit, but it turns out that this argument lets you in fact construct, uh, write your homomorphism as a product of two things, or at most three things which are actually local in the honest sense of local for the plane minus a counter set. So I don't want to go through the details. You could probably work it out yourself. But if you have a phi which fixes some point in uh, the, um, the ray graph, then its commutator length is bounded. Um, and in fact, that implies that any phi with a bounded orbit on R has stable commutator length zero. So that's what I mean when I say that all of the interesting quasimorphisms on gamma can be seen, in fact, from the action on the ray graph and the proper, properness of the action of the ray graph. All right. Well, maybe there's no quasimorphisms at all. That'd be a little bit boring, but anyway, it turns out not to be true, just as well. So let me tell you about how to construct quasimorphisms on groups when they act on hyperbolic spaces. So there's a general technique to construct quasimorphisms on a group G which acts on a delta hyperbolic space and which works a lot of the time. Right? Well, any group acts on a delta hyperbolic space. It just might not act in an interesting way. So you need some hypothesis on the action. But many times you have a group acting on a delta hyperbolic space. There's a general technique to use this action to construct interesting quasimorphisms on the group. So this is something which um, goes back actually to Rem Tulla. These are these so-called counting functions. So he didn't express it in quite this language, but um, then uh, Brooks uh, rediscovered, or I don't know what he did, uh, these counting functions due to Rem Tulla uh, and observed that they had something to do with, well, quasimorphisms, not sure you use that language, but bounded cohomology is another way of describing it. So bounded cohomology, this is after Gromov's very influential paper on that subject. Um, and then, but these people were just working really on the free group and constructing interesting quasimorphisms on the free group, uh, so-called counting functions. Um, then this was really pushed a lot further by Epstein and Fujiwara, Koji Fujiwara, um, for hyperbolic groups in general. And then groups acting on hyperbolic spaces under very sort of mild conditions. Um, there's a really important influential paper of Mladen, Bestfina, and Koji Fujiwara, which uh, basically gives you extremely mild circumstances. You have a group acting on a delta hyperbolic space 
satisfying a very, very weak version of some kind of properness. Um, and the conclusion is that the group has, in fact, a uncountable dimensional space of homogeneous quasimorphisms on it. So you can construct a lot of things this way. Um, so some version of this property is sort of tends to be black boxed and people kind of use it all the time whenever they have an interesting group uh, and they have an action of an on delta hyperbolic space. Someone is going to write a paper that says, oh, this group has infinitely many quasimorphisms on it because blah. Um, and this is an extremely nice technique. The, um, the hypothesis doesn't quite work exactly on the nose in the circumstance of uh, the ray graph, but a very slightly weaker condition does hold, uh, and it turns out to be enough. But, so I don't want to go into exactly what the geometric conditions are for groups acting on a space, but basically it's really more or less the same construction every time. You have to work a little bit to show that the construction gives you something non-trivial, but let me say at least what the construction is. Um, and I want to recast it in slightly more geometric terms. So people tend to talk about it in, in ways that I find is a little bit obscure. I want to, I want to sort of try to talk about it in a, in a kind of a very transparently uh, geometric <coughs> term. So I have G acting on a delta hyperbolic space X, and let's let X be a graph just for the sake of simplicity. It doesn't really matter what it is. I could take an arbitrary delta hyperbolic space uh, like, so, so it was a path metric space. I could take a new graph which had one vertex for every point in the old space and one edge for every pair of points whose distance was less than or equal to one. So I can always pretend I'm acting on a graph. It doesn't really matter. If I don't care about my graph being locally finite or accountable or anything, then I might as well just have it be a graph. It's easier to think about it if it's a graph. And you define distance in a graph by simplicial distance. So if I have two vertices, Then I look at the distance from P to Q is the least number of segments in a path from P to Q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this graph in a way which is compatible with the G action. And I'm going to modify it and I'm going to turn it from a graph into a directed graph. And I want to make it the directed graph in such a way that the distance now becomes non-symmetric. So you might be a little bit anxious about non-symmetric metrics, but anyway, I'm going to do it. So I pick a pair of points, say P and Q, and I'm going to add a new edge going from P to Q. It's going to be directed edge. So I'm going to call this edge sigma. And then for all elements G in G, so if I have G of P, and g of q, I'm going to add g of sigma, another directed edge from g of p to g of q. So this is just a modification. I had my old graph x, and I'm building a new graph. The old graph was not directed. The new graph has some edges which are directed. I just added one directed edge, and then I just transport it around by the action of the group. So I'm building a new graph, the old graph x embeds in it. And now I have a quote unquote distance function, distance sub sigma from x to y is, well, just the distance in the graph. Which is now it's a directed graph or partially directed graph, which is to the minimum of the length of a directed path from x to y. And all that means is that if you want, you can go over this edge, and maybe that's a shortcut, but you can only go over it in this direction. So the distance from p to q, it used to be uh, 4. Um, yeah, it used to be 4, but I've added a shortcut. So now the distance from p to q is 1. What's the distance from Q to P? Probably still 4. Right, so it's not symmetric, but that's OK. Um, the new distances in the new graph, if the old graph was delta hyperbolic, it turns out distances in the new graph are sort of quasi-isometric to what they were before. For any two vertices, 
the distance from P to Q for any, any two vertices P to Q, no, distance from X to Y in this new metric is comparable to, it's up to a bounded factor. It differs from the distance, the old distance from X to Y by a constant multiplicative factor. So it's sort of quasi-isometric in the usual sense of geometric group theory. You might not like asymmetric metrics, but it doesn't affect any of the important theorems about delta hyperbolic spaces. In particular, a geodesic in this new metric, and it's a directed geodesic, is still a bounded distance from a geodesic in the old metric. So this is still a delta hyperbolic space in the sense that geodesic triangles are still delta thin, and for all possible ways of deciding what orientations you want to put on the edge. I mean, it's a new delta. It's like a million times delta, but it's still delta hyperbolic. The triangles are still thin. So what I can do now, I can define a function which measures the extent to which this new metric is asymmetric. So I can define C sub sigma of a group element. So C sub sigma is going to be a map from the group, just a function from the group to the integers. Well, I guess maybe union zero or something. And C sub sigma of gamma is going to be the distance in the sigma metric from the point P to GP. What's P? P is some base point. I don't really care. Any point. Any point at all. Doesn't really matter what it is. And then I'm going to define uh, psi sub sigma to be C sub sigma of G minus C sub sigma of G inverse. So if it were a symmetric metric, this is zero by definition because the distance from P to G minus P, well, it's left invariant, so it's the same as the distance from GP to P. And if it was symmetric distance, that's the same as the distance from P to GP. But this is not a symmetric distance, so the distance from P to GP is not necessarily the same as the distance from, so this is, after all, this is the distance from P to G inverse P, which is also the distance from GP to P, okay? So these distances are possibly different, and so this function is possibly non-zero. So the claim is that this function is a quasimorphism. Why is that? Well, I'm going to pick three points, P, GP, and HGP. So I have H and G are elements of my group. And I can look at a geodesic from P to GP, and I can look at a geodesic from GP to P. Now these might be different, but they're a bounded distance apart. Okay. I can also look at a geodesic from here to here um, and a geodesic from here to here, and they might be different, but they're still a bounded distance apart. And I could look at this distance and this distance, and this triangle is delta thin, and what that means is it breaks up into some compact piece here. So this guy has sort of diameter two delta or something, and then each of these edges, these things are basically a bounded distance apart. And so just add up all the distances. Every time you measured some distance here going in any direction, there was another distance here that was going in the same direction, that, but you're counting it negatively. So this distance here minus this distance here, sorry, this distance here plus this distance here minus this distance here, or, well, sorry, minus this distance here is the same as, so the sum of the positively oriented guys, the clockwise guys, uh, minus the sum of the anti-clockwise guys. But every time you've got a clockwise guy, you can break it up into two pieces, which are pretty close to two pieces of the anti-clockwise guys 
So all the pieces cancel except for some little bounded bit in the middle and so the difference is, zero, is bounded. Okay, so it's really just the delta thinness of triangles. So the fact that the metric is asymmetric is really doesn't matter. In a delta hyperbolic space, all metrics which are sort of G invariant and whatever, I mean, these are all, all comparable metrics uh, sort of behave more or less in the same way. Okay. So how do you build, so that's a quasi-morphism. So how would you build, a, so how would you sure, ensure that you had a non-trivial homogeneous quasi-morphism? Well, you take this quasi-morphism and homogenize it. Well, if you have a quasi-morphism which is bounded and you homogenize it, you get zero. So we have to be careful because we might have constructed a quasi-morphism. In fact, we have constructed a quasi-morphism. But it might be bounded. Its value on every element might be bounded. So what you do is you have a loxodromic element acting on your delta hyperbolic space and you've got its axis, something like that. And what you do is you say, well, I'm going to choose sigma in the following way. I let sigma be an edge from a point on the axis to say phi to the 10 to the 10 to the 6 of p or something, some big number. And that says that if I look at the distance, the function c sub sigma of phi, well, this, the function c sub sigma of phi to the power of 10 to the 10 to the 6 or whatever it is, the distance is 1 because I can get there in one step. But going back, it's typically a very long way. So it tends to be quite inefficient. So the only way this could fail, if there was some element of your group that took this axis and picked it up and turned it over so that it almost exactly aligned with itself going in the opposite direction. And then that would mean that there just happened to be a copy of this thing going back in kind of almost exactly the right direction. So that's the only thing that can go wrong is if you have an axis with the property that there's some element of the group that takes it almost to itself with the opposite orientation. So you talk about an axis being anti-aligned or a translate being anti-aligned. That's exactly what you want to rule out. Um, you can rule that out for many specific examples and Juliet just shows specifically that uh, some examples of loxodromic elements that you can write down have this property, that they don't, that long segments of their axis, you can never take them in such a way that they match themselves with the opposite orientation. So that's just a geometric property you have to check. And having done that, you can build an interesting quasi-morphism um, on your group, which is definitely non-trivial. On phi, after you homogenize it, it's still non-trivial. And then there's this trick, this best Vina Fujiwara trick, that lets you kind of pump this up and get you know, an uncountable dimension space of such things. All right. So. I have how much time? Like 20 minutes. All right. So I want to take what looks like a little bit of um, uh, a sharp tack and talk now about uh, the boundary of the ray graph. So the ray graph is a hyperbolic, delta hyperbolic space. Um, and so when you have a delta hyperbolic space, it has a Gromov boundary and points in the Gromov boundary are kind of equivalence classes of quasi-geodesic rays heading out to infinity where two are in the same class if they're a bounded distance away. So it's a way of kind of adding, yes? So what do you mean by dimension? What do I mean by what? Yes, but it doesn't have to be separable. Typically not separable, yeah. Uh, SCL is a little bit like um, uh, an L1 norm, and this is the isometric dual of it, so it tends to be a lot like an L infinity norm, so it's typically non-separable. Yeah, this is, uh, such is life, anyway. I mean, it could be trivial, but it tends to either be trivial, finite dimensional, or uncountable dimensional. That's sort of the way these things go. Um, all right. So I want to talk a bit about the boundary of the ray graph. Um, and I don't have time really to go into a tremendous amount of detail, but I want to talk about is a connection between the boundary of the ray graph and the action of gamma on another space, a quite different geometric action now, uh, an action on a circle. <coughs> 
So here's a theorem which sounds really nice, but it's actually very easy to prove. Gamma acts faithfully by homeomorphisms on a circle, i.e., there's an injective homomorphism to the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle. Okay, this is kind of uh, interesting. You've never thought about it before. Um, there's a nice corollary. Um, so I, I proved this theorem, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, and I had a completely different um, aim in mind. I wasn't really thinking about mapping class groups at all. Um, I was thinking about a theorem just in smooth dynamics. So there's an interesting corollary. Well, I don't, you can decide yourself whether you think it's interesting or not. Supposing I have a group G, which is acting um, by orientation preserving um, C1 diffeomorphisms on the plane with a bounded orbit. So the hypothesis is that there's some bounded orbit. Um, then the conclusion is actually that the group G is circularly orderable. Um, and that implies, if G is countable, this implies that there's an injective homomorphism from G to the group of homeomorphisms of the circle. Um, so you may or may not find this surprising. The group of homeomorphisms of the circle, orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle, as a continuous group, its homology is the same as the group of, well, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the plane. So maybe homologically these groups look similar, but this is just a discrete group acting, so you're thinking of this purely as a, as a kind of abstract group, but the hypothesis that there's a bounded orbit. And so one of the intermediate steps, there's a case that you have to consider. You look at this bounded orbit um, and you take its closure, and that's also a bounded G invariant set, and maybe the closure has lots and lots of components. Well, you fill them in if they're not simply connected, and then you crush them all to points, and so you, then you have G acting on a plane, uh, preserving a compact, invariant, totally disconnected set. And one of the interesting cases is it's preserving a Cantor set. So you get a map from G to the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set. And so knowing that the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set is circularly orderable tells you that the image of that group in this mapping class is circularly orderable and then there's a way of putting this together with some other stuff to get the conclusion. Anyway, so this was, this was sort of why I was originally interested in this. Um, it turns out slightly more is true. In fact, a countable group, G, is isomorphic to a subgroup of gamma if and only if G is isomorphic to a subgroup of homeoplasts of the circle. So if you like the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of the circle, who doesn't like this group, gamma is, well, certainly a different group, but they both have enough room in them for exactly all circularly orderable countable groups. So a group is circularly orderable, a countable group is circularly orderable if and only if it has a faithful action on the circle by homeomorphisms, and if and only if it has a faithful map, or an injective map to the mapping class group of the plane minus a Cantor set. All right? Um, uncountable groups, so it turns out S1 embeds in the mapping class group, um, but only as a discrete group. Well, this is not a topological group. I mean, you can topologize it in a few different ways, and there's an obvious way to topologize it, and in that topology, with S1 with its usual topology, certainly doesn't embed as a subgroup continuously, but just S1 as an abstract group, it does in fact embed in gamma. Um, PSL2R, 
does not have an injection into gamma. So it's kind of interesting that the, there's, a, there's a, some abstraction. So this group is definitely different from homeo of the circle. Um, so one key difference is that gamma acts on the circle as an uncountable group, but it acts on the circle faithfully and it has some countable orbits. Actually, it has uncountably many countable orbits. Let me, uh, instead of projecting an air of mystery, let me just tell you what the action on the circle is, because it's, it's really very simple to, to talk about. So there's a few different ways to get it to act on the circle. This one is sort of the, 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 the cleanest from the point of view of the relation to the ray graph. So we have gamma, so this is a mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set. Um, so the plane minus a counter set, I'm going to call this space omega. So there's a nice covering space. This is called the conical cover, um, which is the cover, so it's a covering space of the plane minus a counter set associated to the subgroup It's as, this is a cyclic, this is a cover, it's, its fundamental group is just, is just Z, and it's just generated by the loop around infinity. Okay, so Z generated by the loop around infinity. So the loop around infinity, this is a nice interesting element in pi 1 of the plane minus a counter set. And so there's a nice covering space of this, which is, well, an annulus, really, topologically. So topologically this is an annulus, but if we put a hyperbolic structure, so let's let put omega, put a nice hyperbolic structure on this. Um, there's lots of choices. In the end, it doesn't really matter what choice you pick. But anyway, pick one that you, you feel you, you like and you understand well. Um, then uh, omega c um, is conformally equivalent or isometric, conformally equivalent to the unit disk minus the origin. So here is uh, omega c. And the mapping class group of gamma, sorry, the mapping class group of omega, so gamma acts on omega by homeomorphisms. Actually, gamma lifts to an action on omega c by what? By things which commutes with the action of the deck group, and you up to the equivalence relation that two of them are the same if they're isotopic through elements that commute with the action of the deck group. Okay, so omega, gamma acts on omega here by just mapping classes. So homeomorphisms up to the equivalence relation that two things are equivalent if they differ by an isotopy. So lift these things upstairs, and now they act equivariantly with respect to the deck group. And uh, they, they, so they act equivariantly with respect to the deck group, and you want to say that two things are the same if they differ by a family of things that are connected by things that act equivariantly with respect to the deck group. All right. So any representative of gamma that acts here, it lifts up here. Um, maybe there's a, there's a sort of, you, you, you could already wonder why that's true, right? If you have an action on a topological space, it doesn't necessarily act uh, lift to, to a cover, it's certainly not in a canonical way. But there's a canonical way to lift it because we look at how the thing acts near infinity and then we just pick the unique li lift that acts in the same way near infinity. So having the distinguished point here and the distinguished point here, that just tells you a kind of canonical way to lift the action. So 
And it turns out that, um, so an element of the mapping class group, it acts on omega. It doesn't necessarily act by quasi-isometries. It's a surface of infinite type. But it's still true that any lift extends continuously to homeomorphism of this circle. And which choice of representative you pick doesn't affect what the extension to the boundary is. And the reason for that is that there's a dense set of points on the boundary, which are kind of the endpoints of periodic geodesics. So if you have a closed geodesic downstairs here, well, the image of that is a closed geodesic or a closed quasi-geodesic. And the lift of this geodesic here is sort of a round circle. And the lift of this guy, well, it's not round, but it's sort of invariant under a hyperbolic isometry of some kind. So it still has well-defined endpoints. And using these guys, you can get open neighborhoods of points, coordinate neighborhoods uh, basis of points in this circle. Using these lifts, you can get the same kind of neighborhood basis of the circle. So that gives you the topology on the circle kind of canonically. All right. So points in the circle, so call this the conical circle. So there's an action of gamma on this circle. A point here is just a geodesic ray starting at infinity in omega. It just heads out, it does whatever it does, right? Because it lifts uniquely to a geodesic ray here, which heads out to a unique point at infinity. So points here correspond to geodesic rays, not necessarily simple, from infinity in the plane minus the catacet with whatever old hyperbolic structure you want, OK? So that's what these things are. So there's a nice invariant subset, which is the geodesic rays that are simple. So there's a subset of this circle, and this subset comes into three pieces. So the simple rays, there's three kinds. There's the proper rays. So these are exactly the vertices of the ray graph. Yeah, right, a proper ray something that goes out from here to infinity, straighten it out to a geodesic. It's a geodesic and it's simple. It doesn't intersect itself. Right? So these guys here, these are some of the simple rays. There's also the lassoes, right? because if I head out something like that, I can straighten that to a geodesic. Well, that's also simple. And then there's something else which we could call which we call long rays. And these are rays that start at infinity and they head out for a while and they're not proper. They're simple but they're not proper. Who knows what they do? They never get out to it. They kind of recur to some compact piece of the surface infinitely often. But they're still simple. So these define a nice subset of this circle, which is invariant under the action of the group. So it turns out um, R union X is a counter set in this circle. Each gap of our union X has a unique lasso in the middle. Um, and this set, I guess I should say R union X, is the unique minimal set for the action of gamma on this circle. So in fact, um, we can take a quotient. We can define a new circle, the so-called simple circle. So this is just the quotient of this guy here, of the simple, I'll just say it's the quotient of our union x in this circle here, modulo quotient out the gaps quotient each gap to a point. So a point in the simple circle corresponds either 
to a uh, array in the ray graph or a long ray or a lasso, except that there's sort of two, there's one kind of long ray that gets identified with a lasso, namely the long rays which are sort of boundary points in this canter set. So let me show you exactly what they are. So if you have a geodesic which is not simple, it intersects itself. So here's a geodesic which is not simple, it intersects itself for some first point. There has to be some canter set in here, of course. So what do you do? I have this point, I can move it left or right. If I move it left, it converges ultimately to a lasso. If I move it right, it converges to a ray which spirals around a geodesic. So I'm going to call this a long spiral. So the long spirals are exactly, or I could have done it on the other side. So once I get to this guy here, and remember these are oriented lassos, I could push it past this point and then I get this guy on the other side. So my interval in the complement of um, this perfect set, I have a long spiral on this side, a long spiral on this side in the opposite direction, and in the middle I have the lasso, and then here I have things with self-intersection on this side, here I have things with self-intersection on this side. So this is exactly what these complementary intervals look like, and I think I just gave you a proof. Um, okay, so anyway, the lassoes give you an orbit, and there's countably many lassoes, because a lasso just gives you an embedded uh, once punctured annulus in the sphere, in the plane minus a canter set, and there's countably many of those. So that's a countable orbit. Well, the simple rays, that gives you an uncountable orbit. So there's all kinds of interesting countable and uncountable rays. So the boundary of the Gromov boundary of the ray graph, it turns out, can be completely described in terms of this circle. Yes. How many minutes? Zero? Yeah. Zero. Um, let me borrow 60 seconds or so to say that a point in the Gromov boundary of the ray graph corresponds to a subset of, well, e either this circle or actually it could just as well be the simple circle. If you have a loxodromic element, then it fixes two points in the boundary, and these two points correspond to two subsets of this circle. These subsets have finite cardinality. So here's, say, P plus. Here's P minus. Phi acts on the circle, preserves these points, and it has source sink dynamics. Okay, so this is a theorem of Juliet Bavard and Alden Walker, and it gives you a nice correspondence between loxodromic elements in the ray graph and how they act on the circle. In particular, if you have an element that acts on the ray graph loxodromically, it has a rational rotation number. And so you can see, well, every other ray in forward time, except the ones which are sort of at negative infinity, they're heading out towards this point at plus infinity. So that's sort of the way we expect things to work, right? Every point in the ray graph heads out under translation by a loxodromic towards this unique fixed point out at infinity. So that the dynamics here is uh, reflecting, well, what we do expect it to do. All right, so I'm going to stop. Um, tomorrow I'm going to change gears a little bit, and what I'm going to do is just talk about um, sort of an interesting non-trivial example of uh, a subgroup of the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set that turns up in complex dynamics and try to relate it to some of this technology. All right. Thank you very much.